pleasure to have you here, Matt. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I mean, you are one of the greats. Uh, I've known for a long time. I mean, I'm a big fan of your uh, the Gundy trilogy. Oh, I do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I want you to know about uh, the, 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 the this trilogy. What was the special to make this one? Well, um, it's an unusual situation because the Eddie Dickens trilogy is probably my most successful yeah. um, book worldwide. I think it's in 37 languages. And what's unusual is that it was written for just one child because um, he's my nephew. I have many nieces, my mm. only nephew. And he was living with his parents in Moscow at a time of upheaval when uh, there was, a, a, if you like, a Russian mafia. And it turned out that a man in the apartment below where he and his parents lived uh, had a gun. So his parents made the decision that they would have to stay in Moscow themselves because that's where they were working, but they would send my nephew Ben back to England, so he had to go to boarding school. Mm. Uh, so he was um, eating, sleeping, working, playing every day in this in this, this one place. And I thought, well, it'd be quite fun to um, write him uh, some letters once a week, so I'd be doing my own uh, writing books, mainly non-fiction in those days. But at once a week I would write him a, a letter to try and cheer him up. And I thought, what could I write about? And I decided that um, it would be quite fun. Um, I myself had been to boarding school as a child. Um, and it was very old-fashioned. It was very Victorian. They had very strict rules about what you could and couldn't do. So I thought, I know, I will uh, write him a story set in Victorian times. But in England, but not, a high, not a highly researched one. I thought it would be what you imagine Victorian times to be like. Um, misty moors, coaches, cobbled streets, all those things. And I would write episodically, I would write an instalment and send it to, to Ben at school and then two weeks later I'd write another instalment. So it was written to this one boy about this character Eddie Dickens who I named after Charles Dickens. So I thought the Dickens sounded old fashioned but Eddie sounded modern so it was a nice contrast. And I wrote in these letters and over time it was finished um, he really enjoyed it, he read it with his friends and things like that. Um, uh, and then I was with my publisher one day and we, uh, I was at a sales conference where we were selling one of my books which was um, about uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And it was the first children's book in, in the UK that had decided to take hieroglyphs seriously rather than saying the English alphabet is 24 letters long, let's try to take 24 glyphs that are phonetic, so they give the sounds, and then you can write in ancient Egyptian. But of course, you're not. You're just treating it as a code. There's no Egyptian involved. And I was saying there are many thousands of, of, of glyphs. There are three different types of glyph. And obviously, when you're using them, you're writing in ancient Egyptian. And so it was, it was a very, very popular book. But I was at a sales conference, and I got up at the wrong time. So I made some humorous aside, and they laughed. And I made another humorous aside. And after the conference, uh, someone from my publisher, Faber or Faber, came up to me and said, well, if you're that funny, surely you could be writing uh, work. And I took out the copies of the letters, and that became a book called Awful End, and it sold in 37 languages, although it's written for one boy, and that was fantastic. So I then produced one. No, I mean, uh, many fans, I mean, with, they saw the uh, trilogy, a wonderful story, amazing concept. It's like a spice of like, something people like want to have from, you know, Oh, thank yeah. you, thank you. So my next question is to your book, Stick and Fitch. <laughs> I've got, I saw it was Alicia Willick. So I wonder about this new book, what's all about? What's the special about? <laughs> well, it was fun. I had this idea many, many years ago mm. um, about a, uh, a girl and her dog, and they think they're detectives. Now, there are many, many books about children who think they're detectives, yeah. and they solve cases, normally they catch burglars or things like that. But I thought what would be quite fun about this series would be if the crimes, the cases, didn't exist at all. So through misunderstanding, they would think there's a case. They might find a balloon in their back garden, and the balloon might say 80 years old today. Now, you or I know that's a balloon for someone's 80th birthday party. Yeah. But of course, they think it's saying the balloon is 80 years old. So they're thinking, why is it in the back garden? Um, but where would you find old things? In a museum. It must have come from a museum. How did it get to be here? It must have been stolen and floated away. So they go down to the museum and they get there and it's closed. And they go, it's never closed. The reader notices it says closed for lunch back in 10 minutes, but they don't notice that. They look through a window and they see a patch on the wall where a painting had been. 
Uh, so maybe that was stolen at the same time as the balloon. And later on we see two workmen walking past with a mirror to be taken away to be cleaned. And then they see a clue and they see a single glove. And don't burglars wear gloves to hide their fingerprints? And if there's only one, it must mean that the burglar has one hand. And it smells of flowers, so maybe they've been to a florist. So they go to a florist and then they see a man dressed as a pirate with a hook hand, which is very traditional in English <laughs> literature, yeah. going over to do a reading of a pirate story in a library. It's a one-handed man, and pirates are known to be thieves, so that must be that. So they are solving, being very clever but completely ridiculous, solving a crime that doesn't even exist, which I find a very interesting intellectual exercise. And of course I think Alyssa's drawings are so wonderfully characterful yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, the combination of the two has been great fun, but it's quite difficult because there is a follow-up. This one is called Barking Up the Wrong Tree, mm. which of course is an English pun. If you say you're barking up the wrong tree, it means you've got the wrong idea. The next book is called The Wrong End of the Stick, because when you get the wrong idea. And of course they're both also puns because they allude to dogs barking mm. and throwing a dog for a... Uh, throw, pick a pun, throwing a stick for a dog, dog to cat. But coming up with in effect, six or seven different stories that are all using this and not making them too samey is, is, is great fun. But for me, the very exciting thing is this book is not due out until May uh, this year, 2018, but they've actually brought forward the printing just so we can launch it at the festival today. So the children and maybe some adults as well, and people such as yourself, are the first people in the world who will have got your hands on this because it is a, a, a brand new launch day. That's really cool. Because the idea is, you know, these kind of stories, like, you know, there are many, like, uh, stories, like, take the fight and solving brother and mm -hmm. uh, crime. But I, when I saw the uh, the book and the sketches, we're very interested. I mean, this can appeal to any age. Thank you, yes. I secretly do that. A lot of, a lot of adults, because you can read them to children, you can let the children read them themselves. And I always think it's very important, just once children learn to read, let them read books themselves, that's fantastic. But that very special thing, particularly in the UK, um, because it's often the mothers who do the reading, I think it's really great if the father does it as well and shows the importance of books to all people regardless of your gender or what you do, and still have that pleasure of reading to your child. There's a special thing separate to their reading their own things. So if you can have a chuckle in it as well and discover things at different levels. I never, I never write down to a child. Eddie Dickens' books are quite sophisticated in a way and quite yeah. complicated. And this is obviously pitched to the younger audience, but there's still that level of... And, and, and the thing I like doing is you always, the reader always knows more than stick and fetch do. They, they always one step ahead of them because these two, Sally Stick the girl and Fetch her dog, are really very, very incompetent. But they still get results and they clearly love each other and they end up happy. So although they've solved a case that doesn't exist, they're still getting satisfaction really from cool. it. Uh, my next question, uh, I, I hear you're a big fan of Moomin Valley. Ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a very big Moomin fan. Um, Toby Janssen was a, was a, a, a Finnish writer who was um, uh, wrote and illustrated the movie books, and I believe they're not terribly well known in the UAE. Um, Actually, uh, here's the oh, ah, uh, little uh, Mai. Yeah, I, I mean, here's the the <laughs> secret. Uh, the, the, the character, the, the story is actually popular in the Middle East. Mm. Uh, the show has been done in Arabic during the late nineties and the early nineties uh, yes. by the very uh, artists that I know very much. And the show was till this is very popular. Mm. So. Not only, also in Japan, actually I got this from Japan, you know, it was yeah, oh, you know, very big in Japan. It is, I mean, uh, you know, every market, every time I had like uh, branding for the mm, characters mm, and books yes. and everything. So I want to know how do you feel this guy, I mean, you go with this character, I mean, mm. the story, so what do you think of it? You know? I, um, I, as a child, you could get a thing called a book token, so rather than someone choosing the book for you, you would get this token and you'd go into a bookshop and you could choose the books yourselves. And I had heard nothing of the movements, they weren't on the television in the 1960s, and I found this book called Comet in Moomin Land, and I was fascinated by it, and I read it, and I was very excited to see that there are a number of other books, and I couldn't afford them all at once, and over time I built up um, the series. So I really loved movements, and when you're a children's author, People often say, what children's books did you enjoy as a yeah. child? So I would always say, well, one, a very special one was Comet in Moon Land by Toby Janssen. And uh, so that would always be written down. And my wife said to me one day, she said, why don't you just pretend something else just for a bit of variety? And I said, no, this is a very special book to me because I think they can appeal as much to boys as to girls. as a universal appeal to them. Um, so in England, uh, there was a company that was... Uh, 
retranslating some of the board, some of the picture books, mm. uh, so they'd be fresher English versions, and they were also translating into English the first time some of her adult books because she wrote very good adult books. So because they'd heard that I was interested in the movements, they'd invite me along to launches and things like that. And then through that, I met um, Toby Janssen, who sadly died. Yeah. I, I met her her niece Sophia Janssen, who now with her husband really run the whole the whole thing. And uh, Sophia and I got on very well together and appeared at events together discussing the movements and TV programs. I did a documentary that I'm in. Um, so when it came to them wanting to write this definitive guide, mm -hmm. it was about 380 pages, they came to me and that was a dream come true. Wow. Um, the book isn't cheap, but it's a lovely thick book with very high quality reproductions of the pictures and everything like that. And we talk about Torvis life. Uh, and the influences on the characters, but we also talk about the characters and the books and things in detail. And it, it, it's wonderful as someone who's just a fan who discovered it himself, because now, as you say, there are the cups, people got the cups, they've got towels, there are so many different things. Yeah, in general. Yeah, in general. But they are uh, in the process of making a new TV series with um, some very well-known voices in it. Uh, I think the, the, the star, the female star of Titanic is one of the voices. There are a variety of other ones. But what's important to me are the characters, and they look very like her drawings. So it's quite diversity. I'll be talking about Stick and Fetch with Alyssa Alec, the illustrator. She'll be here. I'll be talking about Moomins with my more serious hat on, and then I'll be doing some Eddie Dickens events. Uh, I'm doing one public event, and then I'm at the, um, the theatre where we have the opening uh, ceremony of the, of the festival with about 650 school children on Sunday. And I don't use PowerPoint for the Eddie Dickens, uh, mm -hmm. because I like to see where the conversation takes me. Yeah, but engagement. Uh, yeah, really, really. Because the great thing about this festival for me is you meet very, very interesting authors from all over the world. That's uh, sort of Iceland, obviously, a lot, a lot of uh, Arabic authors, we do from America, all over. And, and I love that mix, but I also love the diversity of the audiences here. You get a real mix of people and cultures. So the feedback you get from them and I want to sort of steer the direction they want to go. So. Cool. My last question, uh, you know, through the years the story for has been evolved, like, you know, in many different way, kind of the culture, the concept, everything. So what do you think, you know, uh, the story over the years has been become? Of the, the festival? No, I, I, I mean the, the children's stories. Hmm. Like, uh, oh, well, I, I think um, I started out, I, I've been uh, published for about 27, 28 years now, and for the majority of that time that's been my only source of income, and that is very, very unusual, um, because people think when they start out that uh, they'll be living off their writers, they'll write a book, and it'll do good enough, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, you're always writing and you're always looking for your next thing. Um, the great thing is if your book is translated into a number of different languages, as you're, t you're not only tapping into that market, which is widening it, but also, uh, of course, um, you, you will be given a, a payment, sometimes very small, but you are being paid for that book that you've already written many times over. When you're starting out, you're having to write the textbook mm -hmm. and the next book. Um, but I still am very busy. I, I still work um, five days a week. But when I started out, I was writing non-fiction for children. People go, what do you do for a living? And you'd say, I'm a writer. And they'd be interested. And then you'd say for children, and then they'd look and they think, well, anyone can write for children, which is so wrong. And then you'd say non-fiction, and they'd just be very disappointed and think you almost lied to them. And then J.K. Rowling came along, of course, and uh, wrote her Harry Potter books, mm -hmm. which were extraordinarily popular. So it's now if you say that you're a children's writer, they go, are you J.K. Rowling? Which is a little unlikely, because I'm two metres tall with a large beard. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it has really opened it out. And what I've always found about children's books is I think you can explore absolutely anything you like. Um, I think if you use humour, which I, I do, I, I won the Roald Dahl Funny Prize a few years back, I think humour, you feel safe with humour, you feel it's going to be funny, and you can actually tackle very serious topics within that. I'm not saying one needs to be issue based, but if it needs it, you can safely take people into different areas. I certainly think in the UK one thing which is happening um, is a young adult fiction is, is uh, very, very popular. And I feel it's important, great though that is, that transition from uh, children's books to adult books, great that, uh, though that is, and they may win a lot of prizes. I think. It's very important that we still keep that five to seven and then, you know, eight to 12 to 13, keep that alive, because I think you want to keep the passion for reading 
going. But I do find with children's books, people go to me, when are you going to write an adult's book? Because they progress, you know, you get bad and you can never write. But I, I find writing for children actually much more rewarding um, because I think you can really take them places and, and have a very special relationship with, with the reader. Yeah, especially, you know, the technology coming up, you know, the, the, the tablets and mobile. Mm. So uh, it's been for the, the children to read the book from the book itself because it's more engaged, more exciting, mm. and more uh, attractive. Because when you read the book, like, you know, on the tablet, like any mm. devices, you don't feel the taste of reading, mm. like an enjoyment. I think that partly might be an age thing, although both you and I are very young and good looking, we're not as young as some people, and I think partly we might be bringing our memories and things to it. I love it. I, if I read a book, um, it goes on my shelf, I come back to it years later, I open it, a bus ticket falls out, and I go, oh, I read that when I was on the bus, there's a little coffee stain there, and I go, oh, I was in that cafe. So the book itself is, is an artefact, is an yeah. object, and then there's the smell of the pages. Exactly. You, so all these things are wonderful for us. But you could say the same with music. What I think is though interesting is, first thing I would say, I think the most important thing is if people are reading. And I don't mind if they're reading it off a wax tablet or an electronic tablet or whatever. If they're reading, that's great. Um, are they as likely to come back to it if it's on a tablet than if it's on a shelf? Maybe not. Um, what is interesting, um, I think the, the real book, if you like, made from trees, um, has made a comeback in the sense that the sale of ebooks has gone down. And I think it's partly because publishers have invested so much in making books look good. I mean, the, down the very expensive end, they are beautiful. Yeah. But even with something like this, it's some of it's shiny, some Colourful. of it's matte, you know, it's colourful, it's a, the, the, the feel of it, everything. They really, um, and I think that's fantastic. So although I personally would say, yeah, for me, a book is a book is a book. I appreciate it if people want to read it a different way, but from my perspective, and obviously yours perspective, I think you can't, can't beat the real thing. True. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Very nice.